Um, talking about surprises, though, uh, one that I, I am very interested to hear what you think, uh, and that is, um, well, what, what I find anyway surprising, but maybe this is showing my anti-Oracle bias, but Oracle presented some super good numbers, some, some, that's a, the, the technical term, super good numbers, um, very strong um, earnings and revenue growth, uh, mostly on the uh, cloud on the back of their cloud infrastructure offerings, which I find shocking because they've been, you know, mostly behind the ball. You know, Oracle would always position themselves as being one of the top tier players, but for most of us, we looked at them and said they were sort of in the the second tier of mm -hmm. cloud providers. Um, and and I think it's just really interesting. Uh, so this it was an article in Silicon Angle that quoted a bunch of analysts that we know. Um, and you know, talking about how they did a really good job of of seeing the shift to Gen AI before others, um, and moving there, and I think it's all bearing out. So for me, anyway, a little surprising, and teaches me never count Larry Ellison and Oracle out. Um, so I was just kind of curious about your read on all of that. So I will say that Oracle has uh, definitely has it had its uh, share of swings and misses in the cloud over the past decade um when amazon was first coming up larry ellison was uh, uh you know very famously ignoring them and saying that nothing was more powerful than the almighty oracle database uh and uh, just uh, going from there and i i you know he missed the mark obviously but uh to his credit and to oracle's credit i they figured out that they needed to get into cloud infrastructure and they made some pretty smart moves in uh, improving their networking and co-location uh, capabilities around the cloud to be able to support the niche, niche, niches, <laughs> niches of cloud that uh, weren't being covered well uh, by the likes of uh, Amazon and Microsoft. And then to be able to both partner with Microsoft Azure where needed and then to fill in have their own uh, platform and applications to be able to support uh, a cloud offering. You know, right now, Microsoft is the only real, uh, you know, big three cloud that has its own real application suite uh, other than Oracle. So Oracle says, hey, there's definitely a space here for us to be able to come in and support um, all these apps as well. And to, you know, maybe not break into the big three, but at least, uh, you know, fill in all the gaps that exist. And I think they've done a really good job of uh, figuring out what that is, uh, which is uh, justified by the 50% growth. But I also think, uh, I, I would not be surprised to find out that there was some sort of a contract fudging going on here as well. Uh, anytime you work with a large vendor, Microsoft, SAP, Oracle, they tend to uh, be able to shift uh, certain uh, line items and say, oh yeah, if you, we can just call this spend Oracle Cloud and then you know maybe you're getting your uh, apps for free, <laughs> you know everything will even out and then we can call this cloud revenue. Uh, I'd be really interested to dig into some of these contracts over the last year and see uh, if any line items myster mysteriously uh, shift back, shifted back and forth. <laughs> Yeah, we we all have seen that kind of stuff. Those kind of games be played, and you know they're they're fiercely can Oracle's fiercely competitive and arguably even combative a little bit around all of it. And and I don't think in in truth, I think the growth you know is probably to a degree real. Um, I don't think there's um, you know there's still a, a far also ran. I mean, clearly in talking. I mean, I I am increasingly talking to executives that at least have. You know, Oracle on their short list now. Yeah, um, or are they actually do come because... up. Yeah, they actually do yeah. come up now. Whereas before, Oracle was just claiming it. You know, a couple of years ago. Right, right. So, so they're they're clearly making headway. But what I I think you nailed it as far as the difference of why this is why I think they're they're finding newfound relevance, and that is the cloud is maturing where it's not just the cloud, right? It's all it's about having all the pieces together. That application suite becomes a a source of strength um i'm not like i'm not 100 100 sold on their acquisition of cerner and this whole idea of industry clouds i'm not but it doesn't it, what what is undeniable is mm -hmm. if you're a cerner shop you're on oracle now and and that is now right. going to prejudice you to say well that should be our starting point 
and 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 so I think when you look at them and you know um, uh, Rebecca Wedeman you know mentioned com the competition with ServiceNow and Salesforce, mm -hmm. and I think if you look at at Oracle's competitive posture now, sort of sitting in this space where they're on the one hand you could say it's bad they're competing on one hand with AWS and Google on one side, and you know then you have sort of Microsoft there, and then you have you know the ServiceNows and Salesforce of the world, but you could sort of argue that actually puts them in a better position because going back to what we have talked about the last couple of weeks is that as a as an enterprise executive, you're trying to simplify. You're trying to going back to what the Broadcom CEO said. I think dead on. You're trying to simplify and figure out how to place bets that that allows you to have a few fewer balls in the air, and so they can because they can cover so much ground and because they have managed to put put, put themselves into a position of a little bit more relevance. I think that actually is going to work in their favor. I mean, I think you know Rebecca made a, a valid point of there's also this concern about having all of your eggs in one basket, specifically mm -hmm. if that basket has the name Oracle on it. <laughs> but yeah. um, you know, I, I think that it's it's uh, like I said, you know, count me as as uh, chagrined here that I think that they have have managed to put themselves in a, <laughs> in a much stronger position than I would have expected a couple of years back. Yeah. And, you know, Rebecca, obviously, you know, she's one of the best Oracle analysts on the planet. Like she's covered them so deeply over the years, uh, you know, so I, I take her uh, both her concerns and her uh, uh, compliments, uh, you know, when they exist, of course, she's a hard nosed analyst. <laughs> uh, you know, I, I take them uh, very seriously. Um, but yeah, I, I think that Oracle's success to some extent uh, comes uh, here because the cloud, because they are hungry and they're still pricing extremely aggressively right now. You know, it's kind of the, uh, kind of like the razors and blades model right now, they are selling the razors. Uh, they're happy to sell the razors below cost. So they're, you know, they're happy to get the business because uh, they're playing the longer game. And honestly, Oracle Cloud is in a growth, uh, growth cycle that we associated with the uh, other cloud vendors a couple of years ago, back when, uh, everything was growing 50%. Well, now Oracle Cloud is growing 50% because they are in that combination of uh, selling and uh, growing mode, and they don't, they haven't gotten to their um, their rightful share, as it were. They haven't gotten to their mature share of uh, uh, business yet in Oracle Cloud. Yeah, definitely, yeah. definitely interesting to see how that continues to play out. I, I will, my last little comment on the Oracle thing is I do think mm -hmm. that to a certain extent, the fact that for whatever reason, behind the scenes, they they ended up there because it sort of ended up behind the eight ball. It triggered this fierce competitive nature that I think is just part of Oracle's culture. And that's probably been one of the the better things for them, right? For a very long time, they they sort of didn't have to care about anybody. And suddenly they were under threat from a lot of fronts. And I think that sort of reignited a lot of that sort of fire uh, within yeah. them. So that's probably been a good thing. I think that's been happening a, a bit of, among some of the uh, kind of original wave of big tech CEOs like Larry Ellison sees this uh, kind of maybe last moment to uh, you know do his last big uh, push. Uh, it's no longer good enough to uh, skip uh, Oracle Open World for the America's Cup and then just a uh, you know, uh, raking the dollars anymore. You're seeing Mark Benioff at Salesforce uh, taking the business seriously after, uh, honestly, what kind of felt like a few years of him being able to look at philanthropic stuff and try to push something off to a co-CEO. Um, you know, you're, you're seeing these moves across the board where uh, kind of, I feel like these, uh, you know, CEOs in their, you know, 50s, 60s, 70s, you know, they had their first big hit and now they are realizing, okay, uh, this is the time to push the second hit. Uh, same with Box, where Aaron Levy is uh, definitely doing his next big push with intelligent automation. You're seeing all these people who are, you know, wonder kids and you know, superstars in their 20s and 30s. And now, um, you know, this, this is the time for them to really push again because they know they've got to do that or be left behind. They've, they they were the ones who left people behind before, and now they know. So they know exactly what they're uh, going up against and looking at. 